Hello everyone and welcome. We are sitting inside of the all new McLaren Artura and this vehicle has a very interesting and unique electric motor so that's one of the things I want to focus on. McLaren says this is the first series production vehicle, road vehicle, that is using an axial flux motor. So axial flux motors are nothing new, it's a very old technology, but it's very rare for them to be used in production cars. There's only a few doing it today and the vast majority out there are using radial flux motors. So what's the difference between a radial flux motor and an axial flux motor? Well, I think the easiest way of thinking about it, with a radial flux motor, which again is the norm, it's what most electric vehicles out there uh, and combustion cars that are using a hybrid uh, powertrain, they're using these radial flux motors. It's basically think of a cylinder within a cylinder. So that outside cylinder is your stator and that is creating a rotating magnetic field that is rotating the inside cylinder, which is your rotor. So the rotor is the rotating part, stator stationary part. With a axial flux motor, instead of a cylinder inside of a cylinder, you have basically a disc next to a disc. So one disc is creating that rotating magnetic field, and then the other disc is rotating with it, the rotor. So what you actually have happening with McLaren's motor, which you can take a look at, is there are two rotors and there is one stator in the center. So that stator in the center is creating that rotational magnetic field, and then both rotors on the outside are forced to rotate. So it's a different methodology of creating an electric motor, and there are unique reasons for why you might want to choose it, like this application of what we're sitting in right now. So there's two real reasons why you might choose to use this style of motor. The first being it has a great power and torque density. So McLaren says this motor has a 33% better power density versus the electric motor used in the McLaren P1. So this is just a 34 pound motor. It's a tiny little motor, uh, only weighs 34 pounds, and yet it's producing 94 horsepower, 166 pound feet of torque. So a really compact little power unit here. The second reason why you might choose to use this style of motor is for the packaging reasons. So you can see looking at it, it's kind of a pancake shape rather than you know a longer cylinder. So there are specific scenarios and specific vehicles where that is advantageous for the overall packaging design. So let's start off with why does this motor have a torque and power density improvement versus a radial flux motor? So one of the advantages, there's three real reasons for that torque uh, density advantage. The first one just being the size of the motor, where do you have that moment arm occurring, right? So torque is simply force times a radius. If you expand the radius of that rotor, then you're acting torque as at a larger radius, so you have more torque. That's very easy to understand. Force times radius, expand the radius. Uh, the other real reason here is that your magnetic flux has a very simple short path. So the magnetic flux being that force that you're creating, that magnetic force that you're creating by having a current go around a copper winding, it creates a magnet, an electromagnet, and so the path for that flux where the magnet wants to attract itself to this electromagnet that you've created is very simple and it's very short and it's very direct in this axial flux style motor. So because of that very direct, very simple path, you have a torque advantage. You don't have to use as much iron to create the same force, uh, so you can pull some weight out of the motor, and you can have this very small, very dense, good packaging, or, you know, at the same weight, you can create more torque, right? So you can pull weight out, uh, or you can create more torque. It's kind of where you're playing with what is your goal for the motor. So we have better leverage, we have a better magnetic flux path, and finally, we have better windings. So with a traditional radial style motor, you have these copper windings that come out of the stator, then they loop back and they go back in the stator. And I, want, I don't want to say that these end windings are wasted material, right? Like it has to be there. You have to have that continuous loop. It's like if you unplug, you know, a light switch, you don't get power to the light switch, but you need all of that cable to get power to a light? No, you know, you can make a shorter path. So those end windings that come out of the stator and then come back, this is kind of wasted material where you're not creating that useful magnetic flux within the stator, it's outside of it. 
so with an axial flux motor all of those windings the entire winding the copper winding is within the stator creating that useful magnetic flux so it's easier to cool because it's not out there you know just doing its own thing where you can't really have good cooling for those windings and it is all contained within the stator it doesn't go outside of it and then loop back in so you have a more efficient use of your wiring with these axial flux motors so for those three reasons you get a better power and torque density now there's of course a downside here right so with these very large radius motors you have a lot of inertia as you put mass towards the outside further and further away you know you have a lot of inertia in this motor so they tend to be lower revving motors in this case the engine revs up to 8500 rpm there's a direct coupling with this electric motor with a clutch so the max rpm for the electric motor in this case is also 8500 rpm whereas in you know electric car applications uh, especially you know in racing things like that you can see electric motors going up to 20,000 rpm where they have these really small very you know low inertia rotors that can spin up really fast so that leads us to the packaging reason for why it's done you know it's got this pancake shape and so why is that done here well if you look at the overall architecture of this vehicle that mclaren has designed they went from a v8 you know a four liter v8 and now it's running a three liter v6 so you've got a shorter engine and you want to include something between the engine and the transmission well that pancake style motor is a great way of doing it without adding much weight and it doesn't take up you know extra space so you've lost one of those cylinders so you have some extra space to work with and so when you put that pancake motor between that and the transmission overall with this vehicle versus say the 720s you actually have a shorter wheelbase so even though you're sticking a motor in there uh, you actually do have a reduced wheelbase making this a smaller car and helping to pull out weight from the car so let's talk about this engine this is a clean sheet all new engine i mean pretty much the entire car is all new the engine the transmission the carbon fiber monocoque uh, the motor everything's pretty much new on this vehicle but the engine is also all new so it is a 120 degree 3.0 liter twin turbo v6 your combined output with the electric motor 671 horsepower and 530 pound feet of torque so what's interesting about this v6 why not 60 why not 180 uh, why did they go with 120 and so with 60 you can kind of think about it you know you're going to have a high engine it's going to have a higher center of gravity if you go to that higher uh, angle that 120 then you're lowering the center of gravity it does make the engine wider uh, but why not go all the way to 180 well, you still have to have manifolds underneath that engine. Uh, so if they were to go to 180 and have these large intake manifolds underneath the engine, well, then that pushes the whole engine up and it kind of defeats the purpose of having that lower center of gravity, right? So in their case, what they've done is they've gone with the 120 degree V and the intake manifolds fit perfectly above the bottom of the engine, but still below those cylinder banks. So the packaging, if you look at it from the bottom, it actually looks really cool how they've incorporated these large intake manifolds and and yet you know it doesn't force the car to ride up any higher or force the engine to ride up higher within the car and so you've got the turbos up top mounted within that v hot v super short distance that these exhaust setters are traveling to get to those turbos um, so you know the idea there being you just minimize the amount of delay that you have in spooling up those turbochargers this is a high boost engine so when you put your foot down you still do you know wait a little bit until you start getting into that boost uh, but you know they're minimizing that path to make it as short as possible these are single scroll turbos uh, and they are symmetrical so you know they're kind of spinning in opposite directions if you look at them um, from one side uh, which is kind of neat you know it looks kind of cool and it means that your cylinder banks have you know the exact same scenario so there's no difference between you know the flow and how the flow exits for either cylinder bank there since these are symmetrical Another big change for this engine versus the 4 liter V8 is that instead of using, you know, iron sleeves within the cylinders, uh, they are now using a Nicosil coating. So low friction material allows for you to use, you know, larger bores. You don't have these fat, heavy uh, iron sleeves. And we're using aluminum block, aluminum heads, and aluminum pistons in this engine. So right behind me, we have a fuel tank on top of a battery pack. Behind that, we have the engine. And it's a bit flipped around from what you traditionally think. The front of that engine uh, close to me does not have the timing chain. It's on the other side so that you can make this passenger compartment, you know, a bit better. And you can take some of that noise and put it further back. You don't necessarily like listening to timing chains, that sort of thing. So the larger part of the engine where you have those, you know, the timing chain controlling your camshafts is further back helping with packaging up here from that engine we go directly to the 
electric motor. From that electric motor, we go straight to the transmission. So this vehicle can drive in purely electric mode up to about 11 miles. So we go from that electric motor directly into a new eight speed transmission. So previously they were using seven speed transmissions, now an eight speed, uh, giving them closer gear ratios, kind of group it a little bit closer together and then have that eighth gear for highway cruising. And also there is no reverse gear. You're simply using the electric motor in reverse. You pair it with that same first gear. I guess technically you could do like uh, eight gears in reverse if you wanted, but yeah, you're just, you know, limiting the, the top speed in reverse and using that electric motor in first gear, uh, so you can back the vehicle up just by simply spinning the opposite direction. The transmission is a dual clutch transmission. It's kind of like a nested one clutch on top of the other clutch. Uh, so you can keep, again, the packaging really short so you can shorten the wheelbase. This does have a shorter wheelbase than the 720, as I mentioned, um, you know, using the transmission as much as you can. And this is a shorter transmission than used in like the 720S, for example. Dual clutch, extremely quick shifts. The only time you'll really notice, say, that there's significant delays is if, you know, you're in comfort mode like I am now, it's in the wrong gear, I put my foot down, you wait a little bit, and it finds the right gear and gets you going. Uh, but if, you know, you're on a track or if you're actually spirited driving, you can get through these gears very quickly, you can downshift very quickly. It is a very fast reacting transmission. So moving on to the battery, this is using a 7.4 kilowatt hour battery. Again, as I mentioned, giving you 11 miles of range in electric only mode. Uh, the European rating is 19 miles of range, so it's probably going to be somewhere between those two numbers. It's the same battery regardless of where you're buying this car. And one of the interesting things about it, it is actually cooled using the cooling circuit for the HVAC system. So you have the HVAC system is designed to not only handle cooling this cabin, uh, but also to handle cooling the battery. So you've got that chiller uh, where you can go within the battery, cool down uh, within the battery and make sure the temperatures stay down for track use so that you can maintain maximum performance on a track. Um, so neat that they're using, you know, the same HVAC system. You've got one condenser, one compressor, uh, but it is used to cool both the cabin and the battery and it is, you know, sized so that you can do both of those simultaneously for whatever duration. So from a performance target, what they were trying to do with this battery is make sure that you could do 10 laps or 40 miles on the Nardo handling circuit. That's where they tested it without any degradation in performance. So they want you to be able to do 10 laps and not notice anything with the battery, right? You're not being limited on power in any way with that battery. It's able to maintain enough charge as you're going around the track and recharge itself as you're going around the track to make sure you can always deploy full power for 40 miles. You know, if you're obviously going in a straight line, that doesn't work, right? But on a track where you're braking and things like that, you can use that to regenerate energy. So that was their performance benchmark to target and make sure you don't run out of, you know, that performance from the battery as you're driving. Now tires, of course, can go away within those 40 miles, uh, but that's a different story. Now, one of the things I really like about the fact that this is a plug-in hybrid is that you have multiple modes that you can choose from. And so you can drive in electric only mode. And unlike what some manufacturers do with electric only mode, if you switch into electric only, which we'll go ahead and do right here, and I put my foot down, it does not kick on the engine. If I'm in an EV only mode and I floor it, I get full power from the EV, from the electric motor, and that is it. So I like that they do that. Some manufacturers will have it so that it always kicks the engine on in that scenario. You have different modes here if you want that to happen. Uh, so in EV mode, it allows you to put your foot down, and you know, it's not a very powerful motor, so it's not like you're gonna be driving it like this uh, to have fun in your supercar. You've got 94 horsepower again. But it is cool, and you can go up to about 80, 85 miles an hour, somewhere in that range, uh, in electric only, without having the engine kick on. And then I simply bump it over into comfort, and then you can hear the engine kick on. In comfort mode, it will kind of balance between using the electric motor and using the engine. If you go up into sport mode, now the engine will always remain on, and it makes sure that it has a certain level of reserve in that battery. And then if you go into track mode, it makes sure that it's always trying to fill the battery all the way up. So it gives you a little indication of where your limit is for trying to charge that battery. And in track mode, it's always trying to charge it back to maximum, so you can always have maximum power to put down. Now, another really interesting thing about the car, this is the first time McLaren is using an electronic limited slip diff. So all the modern McLarens are using open differentials. Why? Well, McLaren was very focused when they're building their cars on lap times. And so their thought is maximize lap time at all costs, right? And with an open differential, which is less weight, 
and using uh, brake torquing, so you can use brakes in order to kind of mimic the effects of a limited slip differential, they were able to get away with open differentials. And so their thought was, you know, why would we put in this complex differential that adds weight, adds complexity, when we don't need it for lap times? There's two real reasons for switching now. Uh, weight has kind of come out of it, complexity, they've got a whole new clean sheet designed for transmission. So this differential is housed entirely within that transmission. So you choose, you know, at that point, hey, what diff do we really want to put in here? Uh, and they feel like the weight penalty isn't that bad now, but also in combination, you know, some people just want to do a little slide and then not think about, you know, a, a one tire spinning up. And again, you don't have to have that happen with an open differential. You can use brakes to make sure that both tires end up spinning and then, you know, you have that slide happen. But it's, of course, easier if you just have a locking diff. Make sure that both of those two tires are forced rotated at the same speed and you get your nice slide in. So this also has their variable drift control where you can kind of set the angle you want to allow the back to kick out at. And so in combination with that electronic limited slip diff, uh, if you want to do some sliding around, uh, this is the McLaren that's that's been designed for it. Not necessarily Necessarily, hey, this is what's going to get you the best lap time. Yes, limited slip differentials have their performance advantages, but I wouldn't say they're absolutely necessary, and I think previous McLarens kind of proved that really well. So as mentioned, all new carbon fiber monocoque, new uh, aluminum architecture that pulls out aluminum, new electrical architecture that pulls out weight from the electrical system. So overall, this car weighs uh, just 3,300 pounds about, and that's considering, you know, the electric motor and the battery pack that's about 300 pounds. The V6 engine is about 350 pounds. Um, you know, that is about 110 pounds lighter than the V8. Of course, you've got the added weight from this electric system. So really, you kind of focusing on, hey, if we're going to put a battery in this, if we're going to put an electric motor in this and, you know, add all this additional weight, we need to make sure we can pull out weight elsewhere and make that weight worth it. And yeah, overall, 670 horsepower and, you know, 3,300 pound curb weight, that's very good. Now, even though they've gone over to this plug-in hybrid design here, overall architecture of this vehicle, they are still maintaining hydraulically assisted steering. So McLaren is a big believer in hydraulic steering. Uh, and when you drive their cars versus other supercars back to back, you do feel that in the steering. There is more feedback coming through this wheel. And whether or not you think that's good or bad, I think it's debatable. Uh, but you get a lot of feel from the road coming through the steering wheel. So there's certainly other approaches out there. Porsche has, you know, very good steering in my opinion, but it's a bit numb as far as the feedback is concerned. This, you know, you're gonna feel everything as you're driving over the road. So different choices, if you like, you know, feeling everything through the steering wheel, McLaren has a very specific, you know, taste towards that style of driving. So the big advantage to using this hybrid style system, which I'm going to demonstrate here, really is your throttle response. So you have that electric motor so that, you know, when you put your foot down, you immediately, you can see, you know, I've just put back by that motor, you immediately have all the torque from the electric motor. Then while that's happening, you're giving the turbochargers time to spool up so that you get that additional boost. So as you put your foot down, you get hit with the torque. And then those turbos pull up and it just keeps going. So it goes boom, you kind of get a step at a certain amount of torque, the turbos keep going, and then that torque just builds. So it's a really cool experience, you know, just leaving it in one gear here, putting your foot down, and then having it build as those turbos pull up, which is very unlike a traditional turbo engine because a traditional turbo engine, you're just waiting for that boost to spool up, right? You don't have that electric fill that helps you, you know, immediately get some acceleration while you're waiting. So that's the big advantage. And truthfully, in daily driving scenarios, not when you're on a track, you know, where you've got the engine up at high RPMs and it's ready at those turbos, just like that. In daily driving scenarios, you want torque immediately, right? Like that's what electric cars are so good at. So if you can take that advantage and bring it into something like this, uh, which makes it, you know, so much more responsive for daily driving scenarios, have that immediate torque from the motor, but then also you can take this thing out on a track, thrash it, keep those turbos spooled up and just have the roar from your engine, you know, you kind of get the best of both worlds from a performance standpoint. Any delay in a car, whether it's braking or acceleration or steering, any delay whatsoever makes you feel disconnected. So the more you can reduce delays, which is what a hybrid system does, uh, the better the overall driving experience. So it is a neat implementation of, you know, a new electric motor and this battery pack here with this new V6 engine uh, to create this kind of cohesive unit that gives you, you know, driving joy. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.